Good afternoon. It's so nice to be with you. Um, if you haven't been on a call with us before, as uh, Marianne said, I'm a volunteer through the Wayne State Institute of Gerontology. I got my master's in gerontology, uh, and it is a, a passion and a, a love of mine to study aging and study aspects of aging. I specialized in Alzheimer's and dementia in my master's work, but nutrition is also uh, keenly of interest to me. And I had a wonderful full semester on nutrition where we talked about vitamins and minerals and uh, how they get absorbed into the system or when they don't, what, what's in the way of that happening. And so we're gonna go through and talk about foods today and how they impact on our brain health and what some good ones are and what some less desirable options are. And I hope that you'll have fun with this. This is my favorite module of all of Brainstorm because I'm just so very interested uh, in everything having to do with nutrition and its impact on the brain. And um, uh, we'll talk about healthy snacks. If you were on last month's call uh, and uh, remembered, I asked you to bring, if you had it, a mineral water. I have my San Pellegrino here, um, some walnuts, if you have them handy, and some dark chocolate, uh, all, of, all of which are wonderful, um, nutritious snacks, but also very good for our brain health because of the nutrients they contain. So we're going to talk about those as we get into the material. So when we talk about food, you know, it's, uh, it's really important to the brain to understand the impact of food on our brain. So, you know, our brains have a tremendous ability to regenerate neurons and to continue to grow new cells no matter what our ages are. But we can really assist and facilitate in helping our brains do that through certain nutrients um, and uh, key chemical compounds and minerals and things that have brain protective qualities. Um, and actions that, that they enact upon our cells. And we're going to talk about some of those things. So, um, you know, when, when we have anything called uh, what I'll call insult or injury in our bodies, our cells react to that. And you've heard this probably in some of the information you've heard about COVID. You may have heard um, a referral to something called a cytokine storm. And I'll, I'm going to explain what that is in really simple terms. So cytokines are proteins that are generated inside our body, and they're generated to help heal and to help uh, fix and repair what's wrong with us. So anytime we have inflammation, it's due to insult or injury. Uh, those are the terms that we use when we talk about inflammation. So if you have a virus, right, that's an insult. And if you have an injury, you have a cut or you break a bone or you bruise uh, your thigh running into the corner of that darn table you need to move, um, then you're going to have swelling and you're going to have uh, protein cytokines release that are trying to go to the site of the injury or in the case of a virus or um, uh, anything else in terms of what we would call insult, uh, they're going to circulate through the bloodstream and try to get to that tissue. And our cells make these proteins and release them. When they dysregulate uh, meaning they don't know when to stop releasing the proteins, that's called a cytokine storm. And that means that they just keep releasing the proteins and releasing the proteins and haven't gotten the message cellularly to stop releasing them. In the brain, what happens to us when that happens is, you know, our brain cells think of ourselves as the, the axon and the dendrite, right? Think of the palm of your hand as the axon and your fingers as those dendrites. And so those cytokines, those proteins are being released for this cell. And what happens is they start blanketing the cell. And when too many of them release, which is what an amyloid protein is, an amyloid is a protein, uh, and it blankets that cell and it smothers it and it kills it. And that's what happens in the brain with Alzheimer's. So those amyloids get dysregulated, they get out of control, and they start killing the brain cells. Now, what happens in the dendrites, right? That's the axon. What happens to the dendrites is another protein called tau, T-A-U, is released, and it prevents those connections from being able to, to form electronically in the brain. And so they start getting tangled, and they call them tau tangles. They see these in brains after death. 
when they analyze them, they see those tangles and it prevents the brain um, from being able to generate those signals. So all of that is a dysregulation of protein, an overabundance of it, or something we call a cytokine storm medically. Uh, you've heard that probably referred to in COVID, and they're studying this really carefully uh, to continue to try to understand COVID better and, um, you know, and look for ways to prevent this from happening. So hopefully when we get the vaccines and we start building our own antibodies, that will prevent, you know, that dysregulation against COVID in our bodies and in our cellular structure and our cellular makeup. So all that to say, right, all of that little biology lesson to say, there are nutrients that we can give the brain that make it stronger and that help it um, and prevent it, give it more um, uh, resistance to an overabundance of cytokines and make it stronger and even destroy amyloid proteins in the process. So we're going to touch on some of those today. So um, it looks like, uh, Marianne, we might have people still waiting in the waiting room. I have a note. There we go. All right, so let's kind of review because we've touched on some of this in our material um, that we've covered in some previous sections uh, of what we've been studying. So uh, let's review the brain a little bit and recap on some of the things we've covered previously. It only accounts for 2% of our body weight, but it needs 20% of our oxygen of every breath, 25% of blood flow, 20% of our daily calories, a constant supply of carbohydrates, and that doesn't mean sugary cupcakes. It means good carbohydrates, right? So we'll, we'll touch on those as well and talk about the differences. And the brain is 60% fat. So um, when, you, when you think about how it processes energy, right, how those cells in the brain process energy, that's why they need the carbohydrates. The fat needs something to burn. And so those are, those are, um, that's the reason for the carbohydrate um, consumption by the brain. Now, just as a brief side note, everyone wonders a little bit about the keto diet, right? And what happens on the keto diet is you are starving your body of carbohydrates, right? And you're feeding your body a lot of good protein. And the brain starts to convert from burning carbohydrates to burning fat uh, and protein because you're feeding it differently. Keto can be tough for people. I've tried it. Um, I've decided it's just not a lifestyle I can do permanently, but I did do um, three, four months on it and found that I just missed, you know, too much food that I wasn't able to eat on keto. And that makes me unhappy. And then if I'm unhappy, I'm going to uh, sabotage my diet and probably go eat some cake and cookies. And then there my diet uh, is laying by the side of the road with tire marks on it, right? So, <laughs> so I have decided that I just have to be moderate and have to really pay attention to how much sugar I intake and make sure that the other foods that I eat are dense in nutrients, that they're really nutrient rich foods. And so that I'm not eating empty calories or wasting my nutrition. So think of it um, as feeding an engine, right? Fuel for our engines. That's what food really is. And I've always had a little bit of a problem with stress eating and with sugar eating. And I, I really admire my son, my 28 year old, because he does a lot of um, hobby reading on nutrition. He's an accountant, a CPA, but he likes to read about nutrition and he gets a lot of exercise. And so for him, it's really sort of clinical. It's like, mom, this is the food my engine needs. Right. So he's able to do that better than than I am. And so I try to model a little more of his behavior than my stress eating inclinations would drive me uh, to to do otherwise, which would be to have chocolate and sugar and yummy things in the house. And we can still have yummy things in the house. They just are. We have to get accustomed to um, tasting them differently and and having things that do taste a little bit differently. So um, we're going to do a little uh, evaluation on brain nutrition here. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I have a, a little test that I want to take us through and I need to look at it separately from looking at the screen, but then I'll come back to the screen and this way we'll just all be able to uh, see one another for just a, a couple of minutes here. So let me bring that up and I'd like you all to unmute because I, I want this to be really interactive in terms of uh, what we know and don't know about the brain and food. So the first question I'm going to ask is a true false. 
Uh, you are born with all the neurons that you will ever have. True or false? False. 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 Good, good answer. Uh, you all were paying attention. Yay. Um, the growth of neurons is a lifelong process. You know, the brain's ability to rewire itself by sprouting neurons and reshaping their connections is at the root of how you learn new information and gain new skills throughout your life. Um, also, when we see people who do, you know, who do well in recovery from a stroke, something we would call an injury to the brain, right? Uh, it's because that brain tissue that was damaged has to come back and grow new neurons or another region of the brain will overcompensate for the one that has been damaged and try to take over and, uh, and deliver some of those same functions. Can't always happen. I have a younger brother who's nine years younger than I am and he had a pretty major stroke a year and a half, two years ago, really deep in a region of the brain that doesn't recover well. And um, his recent MRI shows growing damage in his brain. The right side of his body experienced a lot of damage and he can only do things with the right side of his body, his hands and his legs for about two hours. And then he says they just feel like dead weights mm -hmm. to him. So it's impacted um, his career. It's impacted uh, what he can do, you know, as a husband and a father. And he uh, came to fatherhood late in life. So he has an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. So it's pretty mm -hmm. important that, you know, he do as much as he can with him. And it's really important to all of us who love him that he takes such good care of himself from now on so that he has, the longest life possible. Um, he didn't appear to be a high risk candidate for that. However, we have a lot of atherosclerosis in my family and I've had a lot of uh, strokes on my mother and grandmother's side. He just didn't have the high cholesterol and some of the other markers that we look for, but he had a major stress event in his life and it caused him to have a massive stroke. So um, his, you know, his brain has done some things, obviously, to, to help him come back, but there are some areas that just aren't going to repair. Comparatively, I have a, my mother's sister, my aunt, who's 78 years old, has had two strokes in the last year, uh, couldn't speak after the first one, got a bunch of speech therapy, and now her speech is, is fully restored, 100% restored. Her short-term memory has been permanently damaged though, and she's really having a problem with that. So, you know, the, we need to take care of our brains. They're, they're critical to our lifestyles and to the kind of lives we can live as we age and as we maybe have these health conditions that, that we need to fight um, and take care of. Let's try another true-false here. Your brain consumes one-fifth of the total energy that your body expends when resting, true or false. True. Oh, true. Isn't it more than it's that? It's true. No, that's true. It's actually one fifth. Uh, now, remember, the statement said that your body expends when resting. So that's 20%. So think about your resting calorie consumption, right? Your brain burns about 11 calories an hour, just going about the business of keeping you alive and functioning in the world every day. So while it accounts for 2% of your body weight, it expends 20% of your body's energy. Uh, how about another true false here? After age 20, thousands of brain cells die every day. True or false? True. Yeah. True. Any others? True. It is, it is true. It is true. But it isn't something that should worry us. Uh, because these cells are replaced and the brain has as many neurons as there are stars in the Milky Way, about 100 billion. So the loss of a few thousand daily is a very small change. Now, if there are other things going on, like a brain illness developing, such as an Alzheimer's um, or a, a, a Parkinson's, right, as another very severe brain illness, uh, then we're going to have accelerated damage. And we, you know, we want to figure out as early as we can whether we're candidates for either of those brain diseases and what the markers are to watch for for those. So um, there's been a lot of great research on that. And um, Marianne, I was going to suggest another, uh, when we're done with Brainstorm, another program I've done for um, the IOG is called Demystifying Alzheimer's. And I'd, I'd love to, to tack it on uh, on into next year once we're done with this curricula. I'd love to add that one on for you all because I think you'd find it very, very interesting. So, what so um, after 20, we lose 20,000. What do they call brain? 
20,000 brain cells die every day. Okay, they are cells. That's what I wanted to know for sure. Yeah, they are cells, Thank you. right. Okay. And they just flush out of our bodies, right? Dead cells just flush out of our bodies through our normal lymphatic and, and blood flow, circulatory system, right? They, they just go away. Or in the case of Alzheimer's where they're actually damaged, but maybe not dead, they stay in place and the tissue dies off and, uh, and the brain shrinks. And that's why when they do an mm -hmm. autopsy on an Alzheimer's brain, they see so much shrinkage in the size of that brain compared to what that full brain originally was, uh, what mm -hmm. its weight and measurements were. So here's another true false. Your brain is 60% fat. True. 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 We just uh, refreshed on that, didn't we? So that means you want to eat the fats that are good for your brain, like omega-3s, which are found in both olive and canola oil and in cold water fish, like salmon. And um, I don't, I'm not a fan of sardines, but uh, they are good for the brain mm -hmm. and rainbow trout and mackerel and herring. And we'll talk uh, about some other um, good choices as well for omega-3 consumption. Uh, which fats help boost your brain's gray matter? I'm going to give you some choices here. Uh, A, triglycerides. B, monosaturated fats. C, saturated fats. Or D, omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3. Omega. Mono, monosaturated. Omegas, D. Um, so, those, so those omegas, uh, like salmon and sardines that contain them, right, uh, have many, many health benefits. They, they can build the, the brain's gray matter. In one study um, at UCLA, the adults who ate the most omega-3 fatty acids had the most gray matter in the three brain areas that regulate mood. Wow, that's kind of compelling, isn't it? So yeah. that kind of means that uh, the, to me, you know, correlation does uh, uh, not equal causation, but uh, scientifically, and more studies obviously have to be done before you can fully conclude something. But that says to me, that's such an interesting uh, research track. And if we eat more omega-3s, does that promote a better overall disposition, a sense of well-being uh, because of what's happening in those areas of the brain, that they're healthier, right? Very, very interesting. So scientists are still studying this connection, but, but they do know that omega-3 fatty acids um, is the major, uh, the DHA is the major polyunsaturated fatty acid found in the brain. Therefore, feed the brain what it has, right, what it's looking for, and it is important for brain development and function. And our, our diets um, don't always include a lot of omega-3. So, right. you know, we do have to be intentional about it to get it in. Otherwise, uh, we do have a deficiency of it in a, a fairly regular or normal diet. Um, next, is it true? Next that, question. Yeah, is, go ahead. Is it true that um, things like I was looking up kippered snacks and what they are? The fish smoked oysters. They usually come in a can, and I'd read that they have a huge amount, huge amount of omega threes compared to many other things. Is that? Are you aware of that, or I? I'm not aware of the smoked oysters, although I do love them. I'd have to go um, study their nutritional okay. components and mm -hmm. also see if there are any bad ingredients used in the smoking process, right? That could yeah, could I understand the, that part. Okay, we'll let the, this go for the good. It. Yeah, that could negate the good benefit of them. But um, let's see. So a couple things I wanted to mention. Um, before we moved on while we while we pause on omega-3 for just a minute so i got back in one of my nutrition books this morning to you know make myself some notes for us to talk about this so things that are good in terms of omega-3 are fatty fish so salmon right is a really great source of omega-3 mm -hmm. flax and chia seeds are great sources of omega of omega three, and they're things that are easy to throw in a smoothie. If you like to make a morning smoothie, yeah. um, bags I have bags of flax and chia seeds, and I just throw like a good old healthy tablespoon of each in. Um, walnuts are really good. That's why I suggested bring bring a walnut snack. Uh, pine nuts a little less high than walnuts, but also a good nut for omega three both canola and flaxseed oil. 
and then some additional fish choices that you may not think about uh, beyond salmon are European sea bass. Remember, we're looking for cold water fish here. So something called bronzini. Uh, if you've seen that on restaurant menus or if you buy it from your fish store, I, um, I do um, go to a local fish store that gets bronzini in pretty frequently and buy it there. And also Chilean sea bass. Now remember, where's Chile? It's along the strip of South America, right? Chile runs runs um, long ways along the strip and uh, ends up down in Antarctica, right? And and on top of that cold water. So that's why Chilean sea bass is considered a cold water fish. Uh, the others that are maybe a little bit more cultural would be herring and mackerel. Um, you know, those aren't aren't in my culture, but um, I have a, a really close friend who's Jewish and they're in his culture. And he keeps jars of them, pickled herring and smoked mackerel in his refrigerator and just pops them in his uh, mouth as a snack. So, and I kind of go, oh, I don't know how you can do that. But it all depends on what you're accustomed to, right? Uh, one serving of uh, salmon daily gives you um, your, your near to your daily requirement. So it gives you about 300 um, measurement factors of omega-3, and we really need to try to get about 500 daily. So, um, uh, so if you ate salmon every day on one of your meals, right, you're really going to start to get there. You're going to start adding it up. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about magnesium later on, too, and I'm going to model like a day's diet so that we would get enough magnesium from a natural food source. Um, and this is probably a good point before we go on also to talk about the bioavailability of vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients and what that means to our body. So foods are, some of these nutrients are better absorbed naturally through food as opposed through supplements. That's called a high bioavailability. So when a food has a high bioavailability, it means that our body, our cells, our bloodstream, our digestive process, pull those nutrients out really readily and quickly and our body makes good use of them. Um, many supplements, you know, are not, they're not bioavailable because they're a supplement. So wherever possible, we want to try to get these nutrients from a natural food source if we can, because the bioavailability uptake is high. Um, but when we can't, we supplement. And it's not that supplements are bad or lacking. It's just that they're not as potent for us as getting this nutrition out of a food source. So remember when you're digesting, you know, your uh, stomach lining is absorbing things. And then as you go on through your digestive process, through your small and large intestine, all of those nutrients are being squeezed out of that food. And then that, that resultant um, stuff that's left is our waste, right? So through both the small intestine and the large intestine, it's really, our bodies are, are such wonderful engines. They're trying to get everything out, every nutrient, every drop of water, everything out of the food that we take in and make good use of it for our bodies. So supplements don't work the same way uh, when we take them, but they, they, they do work. So I'm not anti-supplement. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying supplement while still trying to get your nutrients out of your natural food sources wherever you possibly can. Let's move to another question here and talk about um, choline. So you get the most choline, which is an essential, 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 easy for me to say, right? Essential nutrient that guards against memory loss from which mm -hmm. foods? A, egg yolks, B, egg whites, C, spinach, D, legumes like beans or peas? A, eggs, eggs, beans? Egg yolks, right? Egg the, the part... The part of the egg that uh, some doctors will tell us not to eat because of the cholesterol, right? But yeah. uh, the, the choline is in egg yolks. Now, it's in other foods as well, but they are the richest natural source of choline. And so if you are concerned about cholesterol, skim milk also has plenty of choline. So the fat, you know, has been removed for you for health, but skim milk has plenty of choline as well. Not quite as much as egg yolks, but it's a good alternate. Um, scientists have studied the effects of choline supplements on memory in rats for more than a decade. You know, we do animal studies uh, before we do people studies to, to prove out these theories and, and develop our um, hypothesis. But 
the rats who received plenty of choline before they were born, before they were born, did not develop senility in old age. That, um, boy, once again, I, I like to jump to connecting dots and jump to correlation. Uh, of course, more studies um, are needed, but think about eating eggs while pregnant, right? What might that do for that unborn baby uh, in terms mm -hmm. of brain development? Wow. Um, that sounds like a, probably a good thing to do. Um, egg yolks are among the richest natural sources of choline, and um, st some studies in human beings have found that boosting choline, even in adulthood, can improve memory. So I want to talk a little bit more about choline because I did some research and made some additional notes on it to help, un help us understand why it's so important to us. So it it is an essential nutrient. It's not a vitamin. It's an essential nutrient. And it makes the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which you may have heard about and read about. Um, and it also makes the phospholipid lecithin. The body needs dietary choline. So what am I saying there? It needs its bioavailable, right? It needs it from a food source. So egg yolks, skim milk, peanuts, all really good sources of choline for the body. Um, so look at, you know, upping your skim milk intake if you're worried about your egg intake for choline. And if we have time, I'll look in my uh, nutritional book and see if I can get you a list of anything else that is a higher choline food. But again, the body is looking for it to be bioavailable. That's how we want it. Mm -hmm. So um, talk with your doctor if cholesterol is an issue or a concern because medical advice on eggs has changed. It seems to bounce back and forth uh, over the years. Um, so mm -hmm. talk with your doctor about it and see, you know, what his or her advice would be as to how many eggs you should have in a week in your diet. All right, let's go on to another one. Which of these might help protect the brain from diseases of aging like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? A, vitamin B12, B, calcium, C, niacin, or D, folic acid? True. I say, I say folic, acid. folic acid. It's folic acid. Yeah, that is the correct answer. So you know that folic acid is, you probably know, uh, that folic acid is important during pregnancy for healthy fetal development. It's always part of prenatal vitamins, right? And in fact, if, if, you're, if you know a young person who's intentional, a young woman who's intentional about getting pregnant, um, she should be taking folic acid supplements during conception. She should be starting it earlier than just pregnancy. She should start it sooner than that. And you can, you can get just a folate supplement. It's also called folate sometimes. So don't be confused. They are the same thing. Folic acid and folate are the same thing. Um, it boosts cognitive function. Uh, studies, again, these are animal studies. Studies in mice have found that folic acid deficiency plays a key role in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. So I also did a little extra research for us since this is such an important nutrient for the brain. Um, it's a B vitamin. Folate is considered a B vitamin. It relies on B12 to synthesize mm. properly. So that means it's looking for a partner to synthesize properly in our bodies, right? So just taking folate or folic acid isn't gonna get it done. You've got to have a good complement of B12, just as in omega-3s have to have the right proportion to omega-6s in our body, in our nutrition for the omega-3s to do their job. If our omega-6s are super high, then our omega-3s are going to be deficient because omega-6s are out of some of those foods that aren't as good for us, some of the carbohydrates. So, um, so folic acid, a couple of other facts on it. Uh, its bioavailability is 50% from foods. 50%, right? So when you eat it, you're going to intake 50% of the benefit from it bioavailably. Your cells are just going to absorb it. And so 40, fortified foods are 1.7 times more available. So that would be things like cereals are, all, are often fortified. Cornflakes are fortified. Pastas are fortified. So look at your labels when you're buying these things. And when you're eating them, remember 
that your bioavailability is not only higher because you're eating, but it's 1.7 times higher in a fortified food. Um, oh. And the FDA did that many, many years ago. Gosh, probably, I think back in the 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. we started getting fortified foods with folic acid. Um, what it does is it breaks down homocysteine, which uh, aids in forming blood clots and causing atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries or simply put plaque. So that's what folic acid does for us. And, you know, in addition to um, building the neurotransmitters that we need, it, it, those neurotransmitters also help us in breaking down plaque and keeping plaque um, where we need it in our diets. I know my great grandmother, uh, when she passed away, she'd been in a nursing home. And when she passed away, the description of the reason for her death was hardening of the arteries, which is what we used to call atherosclerosis, right? Sort of yeah. the, the slang friendly term for that. All that means is plaque in our arteries. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So um, it really helps, you know, with our cardiovascular health to have um, folic acid. So here's some other um, foods that are high in folic acid. Rhonda, try I think to keep that in Josetta has a question for yeah. you. What yeah, go ahead. I can't. What's the difference between fortified foods, which is different than just the availability of something naturally, and a supplement? Why would you? Well, so, so first of all, um, talking about getting it at a high bioavailability from natural food sources, which would include things like dark leafy greens, okay. legumes. Okay. Lentils are the highest. Lentils are the highest. Yeah. So if you like lentil mm -hmm. soup, eat up. It's really good for you, right? Asparagus and fresh orange juice, fresh squeezed orange juice. Those are all good bioavailable food sources of folic acid. So your body will take in a 50% portion of the folic acid that's in those foods through absorption. Okay. So um, that it will take that's different that's not than your fortified high. foods. Right. That's not okay. your highest. Okay. Your highest okay. is a fortified food, which is 1.7 times more available. I have no idea why. It just is. And your lowest would be a supplement. But if you're not taking in these food sources, you want a supplement, right? If you know you or a loved one is on a diet that doesn't include these food sources, you'd better supplement okay. and look for a good multi uh, that has, you know, folic acid and choline and some of these other things we're talking about in it. But when they fortify foods, they take a supplement and stick it in it. So that's what my confusion is. Why a yeah, fortified but it's, food? Why would the digest the digestive process is different? Okay. In chewing, right, you start to absorb the nutrients from your food right in your mouth, right under your tongue. Those membranes are very thin, and that's your blood supply right there. So okay. when you're chewing a piece of pasta in your mouth or chewing your cornflakes, you're releasing that nutrient right there. So your absorption mm. starts there, and it's higher. Versus a pill, you swallow. It's down in your stomach, right? and it's got some sort of uh, gelatinous cover on it that has to be broken down by your stomach acid, which is, and then there's some level of absorption that happens in your stomach, but it's already started in your mouth when you start chewing. Gotcha, that's very good information. Thank you so much. And so the <laughs> fortified cereals, which, are, which certain cereals have a lot of fortification in them, would be a good mm -hmm. source for somebody. And especially they would, they if they're could on be limited excellent. budget. Excellent. Yeah, an oh, excellent source. This is this is big news, especially for you know our elders that we love and that have a hard time cooking for themselves. Right, being able to have a bowl of cornflakes um, that's been fortified is an easy choice, and it's got the skim milk in it too, so they're getting choline. So cornflakes and skim milk, boom, boom, double bang. Right, yes. you got your you got your choline and you got your folic acid. Uh, right there in, in it, not all that you need for the day, but certainly a good portion of it right there in your breakfast. So, and then add a really uh, deep colored berry into that cereal and you've added some antioxidants, yes. you know, a what blueberry if, or a if, raspberry or a blackberry. What if you want to be cereal. gluten free? What if you want to be What's gluten free? What if you want to be gluten free? Well, then you're going to have to find a different source. Uh, if you want to be gluten-free, then you should eat dark leafy greens, legumes, um, asparagus, and fresh orange juice. 
Thank right? you. Because you may, unless you find a fortified gluten-free pasta, uh, which means you're really going to have to look, you know, go to a health market, a better health market or something like that, and really look at the labels, really study the labels. And sometimes you have to go online because some labels don't uh, release everything that's in the food. And when we get to mineral water, we'll talk about that a little bit later today um, as we get into into it. So I can see, you know, I said this would be an hour and a half, right, um, Mary Ann, because there's so much good stuff to talk about here. So let me move through a couple more of these questions. So what spicy favorite might help prevent Alzheimer's disease? A, jalapenos, B, curry, C, harissa, and D, wasabi. Ooh. Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Dark chocolate will help. Yeah. <laughs> Jalapeno. Okay. Jalapeno. The Jalapeno. answer is curry. And, and why? Because uh, curcumin, which is a chemical, is found in curry and turmeric, right? And many people get confused because of all these different names, right? So we know that curcumin is good. We know um, that, that there are some early studies, and they need more studies, that talk about curcumin bolstering up the tissue, the connective tissue that forms the blood-brain barrier at the base of our skull before the spinal column. Mm -hmm. So that blood-brain barrier thins and becomes porous as we age. And we need it to stay thick and glutinous because it blocks bad things from getting into our brain and keeps them down below the neck, right, where the body can fight them better. As we age and that blood-brain barrier thins and becomes porous and bacterias and things that are bad for us can get in that spinal fluid up the spinal column into the brain. Um, so that's what curcumin is, is, that's our good hope for curcumin, that studies are starting to show us this. We need more studies. We need longitudinal studies. We need more time on this. So where do you get curcumin? You get it in curry and turmeric. And mm -hmm. curry is, you know, something that we can use in foods, of course, and can eat in takeout foods. Of course, the takeout food might have been cooked in bad oil. And so then we have to consider what, what's my risk reward here, right? If I haven't made it myself. And turmeric you can buy as well. I find turmeric to taste kind of, <laughs> so what I, what, what I will use it in is soups, especially in the winter. And then I'll, I'll uh, mask some of that taste with some other spices as well. It's just not something you're going to stir into a, um, bite of yogurt, for example, like I would cinnamon. Um, it just doesn't have that kind of taste. It has a, a definite herbal woody kind of a taste to it. And um, I think, you know, you can use it in foods, but maybe you have a, maybe your palate will have a stronger taste for it than mine does. I don't, I don't think it's bad. I just think it's kind of blah. So I add other things in with it as well. Um, so the, um, the findings also, study findings, are that it can help clear amyloid beta from the brain tissue. Now, boy, um, scientists and doctors are going to study the heck out of this because we keep trying to find a way to cure Alzheimer's. And unfortunately, by the time it is detected, there has been so much damage to the gray matter in the brain that you cannot reverse it. So even if you can clear or slow down the process of those proteins dysregulating, that brain tissue has already been destroyed. So even clearing it from the brain isn't going to restore a person to normal function. Um, and that's why Alzheimer's is such a uh, bear for us to fight, um, because we don't fully understand it well enough yet. We keep studying and researching and studying and researching. There are the amyloid theories. There are the beta tau theories, right? And there, um, there's another doctor um, whose theories I like, which are at about the age 40, you should have a brain scan so that you have a baseline and we should treat it just like we do cancer. We should have preventative medicine and preventative scans for Alzheimer's. So that if we detect it uh, in the brain, if we detect it in the blood, if we detect it in the body's metabolic makeup, we can start fighting it earlier and changing that individual's lifestyle and diet to prevent it or to slow it down. And that ultimately, that may be the answer, but we're not there in the medical community yet no. uh, to pay for brain scans at the age of 40, right? To go get a baseline. 
All right, let's go to another question. Which food has the most antioxidants? A, blueberries, B, black beans, C, chocolate, or D, spinach? Blueberries. I say blueberries. I really want to say chocolate. You're right. It is chocolate. I am. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is chocolate. A mug of hot cocoa is higher uh, than the antioxidant concentration than in either red wine or green tea. Uh, of course, too much chocolate can make you put on weight, right? And you want to get a cacao that has a 70% or greater um, uh, dark uh, or a chocolate that has a cocoa that has 70% or greater cacao in it. I should say it that way. Blueberries, black beans, and spinach are all rich antioxidant sources, but you might have to eat, you know, like eight cups of blueberries <laughs> to get the, the equivalent of what you can get in that right concentration of hot chocolate. So again, look for a, a, a hot chocolate mix that has the right 70% or greater concentration in it. Or you can just eat a dark chocolate that has that. You have okay. to, you know, if, if you're used to milk chocolate, you have to acquire the taste because dark chocolate is different. It's more bitter um, than, you know, milk chocolate. And that's because milk chocolate has a lot of sugar in it. So, um, so you do have to select carefully there. Now, which of these drinks may sharpen your mind? A, milk, B, green tea, C, orange juice, D, water. Green tea. Green tea. Green, green tea. There, there's another one on the list. Try to guess the second one. Water. 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 Yeah, green tea and water. Absolutely. So a cup of green tea is more than just a soothing break on a winter afternoon. Uh, a recent Japanese study of 1,000 people over the age of 70 found that those who drank the most green tea, and remember culturally, they drink a lot of green tea, showed the least signs of cognitive decline associated with aging. Coffee and other kinds of tea don't yield the same results. It's important to make sure you're hydrated with water also though for optimum brain health. It's essential to our cellular functions. Okay, which berry has been linked to reducing brain cell damage? A, blueberry, B, cranberry, C, strawberry, D, lingonberries. Cranberry. Say that again, I didn't hear quite hear that. Cranberry. Cranberry. Cranberry is the correct answer. Um, in another um, animal study, scientists found that rat brains exposed to stroke-like conditions, then treated with cranberry juice extract, preserved twice as many brain cells as the brains that weren't treated with the extract. Other studies have shown that cranberries can help fight cancer and heart disease uh, due to their ri rich antioxidant content. And, you know, we, we drink cranberry juice to fight a urinary infection, right? So we yeah. know that it has really strong properties. Uh, as an antioxidant and as an infection fighter. So, all right, let me go back to sharing here and um, get us back on track with our slideshow. I'll go back to that one. And I did, uh, you know, I did um, deviate with a lot of information there. And that's why I ask that we make this one a little bit longer because there's just so much great research around these nutrients and supplements. So um, let me resume slideshow. There we go. We didn't do that um, Q and A as a partner exercise. If we'd been together live, we would have uh, paired off and done it as partners. And one of you would have had the answer sheet and one of you would have uh, been fielding the questions, but you guys did great and you had mostly right answers. I think, I think maybe on all but one question where you may have uh, gotten surprised or learned a little bit. So uh, let's go ahead and go on forward. So when we look at food groups or talk about food groups, of course, we all know that not all carbs are created equally. There are good carbs and bad carbs, right? That's um, pretty basic. I think everybody has a pretty fundamental understanding of that. Um, and especially if you're concerned about maintaining stable blood sugar levels, you need complex carbs because they slow down the intake of insulin in our body and they work better for us in our, in our uh, blood glucose level maintenance than simple carbs do. Simple carbs give us that great spike. I mean, sugar, wow. Um, you eat a um, cupcake and you get that icing. And as I mentioned earlier, those membranes right under your tongue, you get, you want a sugar buzz, 
put that icing right under your tongue and just hold it there for a little bit. And it's going to go right into your bloodstream. That sugar is. So um, by the same token, you may not want to do that. You may just want to go ahead and eat it. If you take any liquid medications or liquid vitamin supplements, sometimes uh, I'll take a liquid B vitamin. I will put that dropper right under my tongue and just hold it there in my mouth for a little bit before I will swallow it because that absorption is the greatest uh, right into your bloodstream right there under your tongue. So just know that uh, nutritionally that if you're taking any kind of a liquid supplement, that's a great place to hold it in your mouth for just a few seconds before you go ahead and swallow it. So um, you know, we have protein, dairy, vegetables, fruits, and fats, all of these components. Uh, in our diets every day and the decisions we make really affect our nutrition and our health in terms of how we um, how we stack them up and how we um, distribute how many of each thing we're going to take every day. Lots of different, uh, you know, advice out there um, in the world. The National Institute of Health, I think, has some good dietary advice um, as well. We'll talk a little bit about the diets, though, that are best for the brain. Um, as we get more into the medic or into the uh, material here. So the DASH diet, which is a hypertensive diet, um, one my doctor recommends me uh, to, to follow as closely as I can because I do take medication for high blood pressure. Uh, you know, it consists of whole grains, um, fruits, vegetables, nuts and beans, low fat or non-fat dairy, good fats or oils, and then lean meats, fish, and poultry, no more than two per day. A um, lot of, you know, a lot of uh, different studies can contribute here. Um, I happen to like uh, a really nice steak, but I only eat it once a week. So my husband and I have a routine. On Sunday nights, I will get a nice piece of tenderloin, and we will cook it on the smoker, and I eat a very small piece, a three-ounce piece. Um, and if it's bigger than that, I cut it off. And I feed little tidbits to my dog who loves me dearly for it, or I put it in a baggie and stick it in the fridge for, you know, additive to a salad or something else for a different meal in the week. A three ounce piece of steak. Well, how big is that? Does anybody have an idea of what you could compare that to? Deck, a deck of cards size, is that right? Yeah, a deck of cards or about this much of your palm, yeah. right? Um, and also, you know, it's got to be the right thickness or thinness as the case may be. We have a local market that has wonderful tenderloins in their case. I get one big one, I butterfly it, uh, and it makes two steaks for both of us. So it makes our dinner. And that's the red meat that we get once a week. Now, I think when my husband is out of my um, supervis supervisory um, abilities, he might occasionally eat a little more red meat. You know, there might be a burger in there uh, during the week sometime when I'm not around to uh, help supervise his choices. And, you know, that's okay, too. We're just not eating it every day. A uh, lot of studies on red meat and processed meats and their correlation to cancer, uh, to colon cancer. So again, that's just a, it's a substance we want to watch out for. It definitely has nutritional benefit as long as it's lean, right? But we we can't be eating fatty meats and steaks every day and expect to stay healthy. We won't. We just simply won't stay healthy from doing that. Where do eggs fit into this? The dish. It depends on. That's why I'd point you to your doctor because there's there's conflicting advice okay. out there for um, you know for egg consumption. My doctor's not particularly worried about it for me. I'm sort of on a at a borderline for having high cholesterol. We're trying to keep me off medication. I really don't want to add another medication if I don't have to. So I probably eat two eggs a week including the yolks. That's not very much. I probably could have more than that, but um, that's probably really where I am. I'd like to eat more than that because of how rich they are in nutrient, how nutrient dense they are, but that's probably where I am on them. Um, so what's wrong in our country? Why are we also, you know, why are we as a nation so obese? Because of this portion distortion, right? Because of what we're being served when we go out to eat in restaurants. You know, most diets will say moderate, right? Even uh, even Weight Watchers will say, have anything you want, just moderate it, right? Keep an eye on the size of your portions. So this meal out in a restaurant is, the one on the left has way too much food on it. It's two meals right there. And so if you're if you can be disciplined and cut half of it off and put it in a box to go, then you have another meal at home. 
Or, uh, as my husband and I will often do in a restaurant, is we will order one meal, and then we'll order an extra salad or an extra soup, or maybe an appetizer, and we will split that main entree. And it's not because we're cheap. It's because we're trying to take care of ourselves and watch what we're eating and how much of what we're eating. Um, and I think that's really good advice. Either immediately ask for a box and put half of it away, or share your entree with your loved one um, if, if you're accustomed to doing that. Now, I guess right now in a time of COVID, we would say, don't do that. Don't do any sharing. Get a box and put half of it away right away, right? And, uh, and do it that way. So again, portion size is just kind of a reminder of, of what are good portion sizes. Uh, pasta, the serving should be the size of a clenched fist. Butter would be the size of uh, your, your fingertip, right? That first, uh, the finger up to the first knuckle. Cheese is a portion equivalent to around two fingers, right? Not, not two whole fingers, just like a section of two fingers would be two ounces of cheese. Peanut butter, two tablespoons is about two thumb size. Um, meat, the recommended serving is three ounces, roughly the size of your palm or that deck of cards. That's really small when you look at what you get served in a restaurant sometimes, isn't it? I mean, that's really little. Um, sometimes I'll get a, even a piece of fish that, that they'll bring out this huge mound of a uh, piece of salmon and underneath that there are mashed potatoes or whatever else they're serving it on top of. And I just kind of sigh because it just, it seems so wasteful to me. I mean, I will wrap it up and take it home, but I, I'm not a big lover of reheating fish. I like to eat it when it's fresh and hot. Um, and if I do take it home and have it cold, then I'll probably uh, flake it and throw it into a salad and eat it that way, or maybe stir it into my scrambled eggs because I like it that way too. But, um, you know, it just kills me how much food is served in our restaurant portions. And uh, we, we really can't, take that for granted. We have to be intentional about our choices there. So let's talk uh, a little bit about calories and see if you have guesses here on what the daily recommended requirements are. So how about an active woman um, age 60 or higher? What do you think the caloric recommendation is? Maureen, I think you're muted. You may have given us a guess there, but you're muted. Uh, 1,500 calories. 1,700. That's a good guess. 1700 was that the other guess 1500 yeah. 1700 the actual answer is 2000 if you're active you know you can eat 2000 calories because you're burning it's calories in calories burned uh you know at the end of the day that that controls our weight but if you're a couch potato what do you think the amount is a thousand um, not quite at our ages. Uh, it's 1600 for age 60 uh, as a female couch potato. I'm not one. I try to be very active. I have my couch potato days. Okay, I'll be honest, but uh, I try to stay pretty active. How about an active man age 60? What's uh, the recommended caloric uh, intake? 3000? Not quite that high. It's 2400 no. close, to, no. close to the female. Yep. And the couch potato man is 2000. So, and these are averages, your height matters, right? And calorie needs decrease every year we get older. So if that's at age 70, those numbers would be quite a bit lower. Um, and it, at age 80, my dad's 87, and I witnessed that he really will only eat two meals a day. Um, now, he just doesn't have the same appetite. And he also knows that he can't, if he eats three, he will start to put on weight. So there are our answers. Um, we're going to skip the what's cooking game. If we were together live, I'd have some uh, pictures and hold them up and we'd try to select uh, items that would give us a 400 calorie breakfast and an 800 calorie dinner. But since we're not live, it's hard to do that one um, uh, virtually. But I do want to spend some time talking about water. Uh, and we're going to spend some extra time here and, and, uh, Remember, I asked you if you had it to bring some mineral water to the table today or to our call today. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to give you some facts about it as well. So first of all, dehydration is really bad for our brain health. And it's, it's something that's quite common. It's very common for us to be dehydrated. So foods with high water content like vegetables and fruits count toward uh, a water consumption goal. But caffeinated drinks can act as diuretics and carry extra fluid out of the body. Uh, recommended water consumption is about two liters a day. 
Uh, how many of us think we're getting that, honestly? I mean, I'm not even raising my hand, and I think I drink a lot of water, right? Um, and the other thing is, if you're drinking coffee or tea, you are taking in water, but your kidneys have to filter it. And that means your kidneys have to work extra hard to get that water out of that coffee or tea. So uh, in the morning, if your urine color, I don't know if you can see the full slide here, but if your urine color is a clearish light yellow, that's good. And if it's a deep yellow, that's bad. That means you're dehydrated. You did not take in enough water the previous day. So look at that and look at what you can do, you know, to start to um, up your water intake. And let's talk a little bit about the water content of foods, uh, foods that are easy, you know, to, to eat and get water into the body. So mm. milk, you know, cantaloupe, strawberries, watermelon, we certainly can see that even just in the name, right? Lettuce, cabbage, celery, um, spinach, <clears throat> pickles, squash, but cooked squash, uh, fruit juice, yogurt, apples, grapes, oranges, carrot, broccoli, cooked, pears and pineapple. Um, next tier down, bananas, avocados, cottage cheese, ricotta cheese, baked potato, uh, cooked corn and shrimp. I really probably wouldn't have guessed many of those uh, as having pretty decent water content in them. And then the next tier down, pasta, legumes, salmon, ice cream, chicken breast, uh, then ground beef, hot dogs, feta cheese, steak, then pizza. Um, pizza getting to the lower end of the screen here. <laughs> so, so don't take away that eating pizza has good water content for you. It doesn't. <laughs> and then um, cheddar cheese, bagels, and bread. And then at the very bottom, things like pepperoni, sausage, um, uh, processed meats, right, cake, and biscuits. So up at the top, that's where we want to stay in terms of taking in water that ha or taking in foods that have a high water content. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, mineral water and what's in it and why it's so good for us. So one of the other essential nutrients that we run short on as we age and is often uh, undetected is magnesium. Uh, magnesium is so important for our brains and so important for our cells. Magnesium basically feeds the, the cellular metabolism and gets that cell revved up and going and burning and doing everything that it does. Uh, and so magnesium is really, really good for us, and it is an essential nutrient. So in mineral water, you can get magnesium, uh, and you, it is highly bioavailable from your mineral water. It is 50% available to you from mineral water. So if I stop sharing really quick and jump over to my other slide deck, I have a special um, slide on minerals and the brain here and want to share that with you again, but a slightly different deck. Should be popping right up here. All right, so for minerals and the brain, uh, you know, parking on magnesium here, calcium and lithium for just a moment. Uh, let's talk uh, about my little chart down here on mineral water. I'm a big fan of mineral water. I, I actually like the taste. I love it over ice. I find it's really refreshing. And if I'm just jumping in the car to go run errands, I'll, I'll take an uncooled can of it or a plastic bottle of it along with me and drink it while I'm errand running. So uh, the mineral waters that I have looked up are uh, Gerol Steiner, and I have only found this at Trader uh, Joe's. I haven't found it at um, other big markets. Uh, it is the highest in magnesium. In a liter of Gerol Steiner, there are 112 milligrams of magnesium. And we are recommended for women to get 305 a day and for men to get 400 a day. Uh, so you can see that you have to work to get your magnesium in, right? It isn't just going to happen. We'll talk a little bit about foods and, you know, the bioavailability of it in food, too, here in just a moment. Um, Perrier online, they don't print on their bottles how much magnesium. And online, all I could find was sort of trace amounts. So you might love Perrier, but I would suggest you move over to San Pellegrino 
because you're wasting your uh, drinking of mineral water right here. You're not getting a magnesium boost out of it where you're still getting a calcium boost out of it. But let's go over here and at least go to San Pellegrino and get some magnesium and calcium out of it. Or if you can find Gerald Steiner, which is a German mineral water uh, and it comes in glass bottles. So it's, you know, can be a little harder to handle because they're big and they're heavy. Um, you've got your highest concentration of magnesium and calcium uh, in Gerald Steiner. And I had to go online to find this information. They don't print this stuff on the bottles, but you can find it if you go out and you're determined to, to hunt it down. Now, there's also trace of lithium uh, in Gerald Steiner. And, and remember that lithium is also a, a drug that's used as a chemical. It's used as a drug sometimes too, but it promotes a, a longer lifespan, lowered rates of mental illness. That's why it's also used to treat mental illness and microdoses have been shown to improve cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's. They're saying 0.3, and we're saying down here, Gerald Steiner has 0.1 in a liter. So um, lithium isn't bad for us to get it as a naturally observe, uh, absorbed uh, nutrient or mineral as well. Um, so a couple of other things in uh, some studies that I, that I had done some research on. Danish population-based study of 73,000 plus people with dementia and then 733,000 persons in a control group. The uh, incidence of dementia was decreased in those who were exposed to um, uh, mineral water and increased in those uh, you know, who had that exposure. So um, magnesium leads to heart and bone health. Uh, it helps prevent bowel disease. It helps prevent migraines. It reduces chronic inflammation and it enhances calcium absorption. So this is another one of those partner minerals where it works really well with calcium. Uh, we already talked about what lithium can do. This is useful as a prevention and that's what most nutrition is for us. It's a prevention, not necessarily a treatment. You don't wanna overdose on lithium because it will affect a thyroid function. So there's a, like I say, just very little in the Gerl Steiner, but it is a good um, mineral for us. We wouldn't wanna go seek it out and try to uh, dose ourselves with more. Um, so a couple of other things on magnesium here. Three ounces of halibut equals 125 against the 305 daily for women or the 400 for men. So halibut isn't one of our cold water fish that's good for us in other ways, but halibut is good for us from a magnesium content. So it's another fish that's very good for us. Uh, other foods that are rich in magnesium are cashews, artichokes, peanut butter, watermelon, bananas, and plain yogurt. All of those are magnesium containing foods. And so I, I pulled a few out to just say, hey, if we wanted to try to get to 400 a day for men, what would be some things that could be in our diet every day that would get us there? Well, we could have halibut for dinner tonight instead of salmon, right? Um, and that would give us 125. If we had a cup of yogurt at breakfast and stirred berries in it, and maybe some uh, fortified cornflakes, stirred into yogurt instead of with skim milk, we'd get another 47 against our count of 400 of magnesium for the day. If we had two tablespoons of peanut butter, we'd get another 50. Uh, now we're at our, our 125 and our yogurt and our peanut butter almost add up to another 100. So we're halfway there in terms of getting enough natural magnesium in our diet in the day. Let's say I want to snack on some cashews. I can have an ounce of them and get 75 milligrams of magnesium. Um, if I have a, a slice of whole wheat bread, I get 25. My, one of my very favorite go-to breakfasts is a piece of whole wheat toast with peanut butter on it. So when I do that, I have had 75 against my goal daily of 305 just in my breakfast. Um, and then a medium baked potato has 35 of magnesium in it with skin, you've got to eat that skin uh, because that's really where the nutrients are in that baked potato. So if I had the halibut and the yogurt and the peanut butter and the cashews and the whole wheat uh, piece of bread and the baked potato, I would have achieved 407 against a goal for men of 400 in my daily diet of magnesium. So there are a lot of magnesium rich foods out there and we just need to, um, to be intentional, like I said earlier, about making sure that they're in our diets. Uh, and that we're getting that absorption. 
and and we are deficient in it as we age. We are absolutely deficient in magnesium. Don't forget that your skin is your largest organ. And there are sprays that you can get in health food stores that contain magnesium. Uh, you can take an Epsom salts bath and get a really nice dose of magnesium out of taking an Epsom salts soak as well. So don't forget that there are other ways you know, for our bodies to intake and make sure that this is bioavailable. So um, if you take your mineral water with a meal, you know, I said earlier that it was 50% uh, bioavailable. The magnesium in miner mineral water was 50% bioavailable. If you take it with a meal, it boosts it even more. So consider maybe having mineral water with, with dinner or with lunch. Uh, as an accompaniment to your meal and maybe not just as your water intake for the day. Uh, and I don't recommend you just only intake mineral water, but I'm recommending that you incorporate it into your water intake somehow because these mineral waters also have sodium in them. And so you want to uh, watch out for that if you're watching your sodium. Okay, let's go back to the other information here. Everybody staying with me okay? Is this is this interesting? Outstanding. I think everybody's muted. Absolutely. Okay, great, great. I, I really wanted to give you that some of that extra research, you know, that goes along with this that kind of helps explain the why uh, and what it does inside our bodies rather than just say, hey, this is really good, you should do it. So um, looks like my slides are frozen. There we go. Okay, so um, eating problems as we age. Things do happen to us, you know, as our body's aging and our organs are aging. We can develop indigestion or poor digestion. Uh, we can develop chronic heartburn and acid reflux. Uh, anybody who has these conditions should look at their sugar intake because sugar creates heartburn. Uh, and you really should study your sugar intake in a day as well. And you should study your intake of high acidic foods as well. And your doctor will recommend that, you know, and, and, and work with you on that. But the minute I, I, had, I had heartburn and acid reflux, and the minute I started cutting back the sugar, it went away. Um, now, if I go out to dinner with my husband and I have Italian food and I have a red sauce and I have a, the wine I like to drink, which is white, not red, uh, with my dinner, chances are I'm going to need a Pepsid before I go to bed at night because I'm probably going to have heartburn from that. There was the sugar in the wine. There was the acid in the tomatoes, right? And they're going to probably trigger heartburn for me. So I know that sometimes I'll take a Pepsid before I go out to dinner if I know those are the foods that I want to have. We can have problems with developing constipation, and that's typically because we're dehydrated. Again, we're not bringing enough water in to move that food throughout our bowels and throughout our system and to make sure that that waste product, when it comes out, is, uh, is soft and moist on the other side and not dry and hard uh, and creating problems for us. We can have dry mouth develop, teeth and jaw pain, diverticulitis, very common as people age. I have it. Uh, and I don't necessarily watch my diet for it, but I make sure that whatever I eat, um, if I eat things that are seed-like, you know, like sunflower seeds or anything like that, that I chew them really, really sufficiently so that they're not going on down into my stomach, um, not completely chewed up into a paste. Um, I have lactose intolerance. I've had it now for about five or six years. Uh, it was a shock to me to learn that that's what I had. I started having terrible um, symptoms. I thought it was IBS. And I still have some sort of undiagnosed issues, but uh, I thought it was IBS. And I thought, how are you going to isolate? Because the doctors weren't being particularly helpful. How are you going to isolate what is causing this discomfort and this pain? Um, and so I took dairy out of my diet and didn't have a problem. So now I take lactate uh, if I'm going to have, you know, Italian food with cheese on it. My, and my kids even know this. My husband knows this. Mom, do you have your pills? Do you have your lactate? Right. Um, so I have to just have those. Now I can eat. It's interesting. I can eat uh, Greek yogurt just fine and don't have any trigger there. But I can't. And there are some cheeses that I can eat because they are uh, very low lactose cheeses. But ice cream will put me, um, you know, in in the fetal position in pain. Um, and so there are just things that, you know, if I'm going to eat them, I have to take two pills to have a little dish of ice cream. I buy uh, lactate ice cream now. 
uh, when I want a little ice cream. And even if I eat too much of that, I still will have an impact, even though it's supposed to be low lactose. So I just know this, you know, I diagnosed and I isolated and I did kind of a scientific test, change one variable. Did what happened to your digestion? Was it better? Was it improved? Did you lose the pain, right? Um, so these are things that are naturally occurring as we age. And it doesn't mean you have a disease per se, although IBS would be considered a disease, but it's a condition that can develop as we age and as our organs are changing. So um, let's talk a little bit about nutrition for head and heart. We've talked a lot about omega-3s and we've talked about the, the great food sources of omega-3s. Uh, we really want to increase our C and E because these are our antioxidants. The more deeply colored a food is, the better it is as an antioxidant. Uh, we want to make sure we have five servings a day. We want to take in green and leafy. Um, if you don't love kale, um, the way that I like to eat kale, I'll eat a kale salad if it's been massaged, meaning that kale has been cut up or torn up and it has been at, uh, hand massaged to break it down and make it softer. And it sat in its oil and vinegar for me for a day before I will eat it. I like kale chips. I can, you know, cut them up and bake them and make kale chips. But if you're just going to cut up some raw kale and put it on a plate for me, I'm not going to like it. Uh, it's too rubbery. I think it's hard to eat. Um, and I don't like the taste. I like it sauteed and it breaks down very fast when you saute it. Uh, I like it on the side with scrambled eggs. Um, so it's a good thing for me to get in in the morning as well. Limit your red meats and processed meats. Um, antioxidants, blueberries, right? Raspberries, blackberries, those vibrant colored foods, but blueberries are uh, very, very high in antioxidant. In the summer when they're plentiful and they're inexpensive, I'll buy them in a larger uh, batch and I'll just put them in baggies and throw them in the freezer. And then they're frozen to throw into smoothies as well. And I'm getting them throughout the winter when they're not as plentiful. Dark chocolate, right? And then uh, just for nutrition for head and heart, for the heart part, is we are social creatures. We like to be with people. Try to eat a meal socially a day. That obviously is not something we can do right now unless you're just in your immediate household or your immediate family. But maybe start thinking about Zooming with a friend while having dinner. Or maybe you Zoom with a friend and you eat a handful of walnuts as your appetizer and a uh, small glass of red wine or a glass of grape juice. I have uh, an older couple who are friends who their cocktail hour every day consists of a glass of grape juice and a handful of walnuts. And I think they're really smart uh, to do it that way. I personally would be having the wine and not the grape juice. So, uh, you know, do what works for you and, um, and figure out how you can be a little more social, especially in this time of COVID. Uh, I think what I want to do, I wanna double check um, the balance of slides here, but I wanna jump out to some of the antioxidants real quick, which are in my other deck, uh, which I will go to. And let me get the right slide up here because there's just, um, I think a couple of really, key takeaways in that vitamin C discussion. So I will share that again. And again, this is the deck I have that uh, is on demystifying Alzheimer's and has a section on nutrition in it. So um, we will hopefully get to that. There we go. Okay, so slideshow from the current slide. There we go. So let's talk about vitamin C and the difference between water soluble and fat soluble vitamins. So uh, very quickly, I'm just gonna hit some high points on this and I'd be happy to take these slides out and send them uh, to Marianne so she could post them for you all. Cause all of this was done as part of my um, uh, master's research. So um, it all has research behind it. The deck has um, a slide full of references too. It's just not my, my um, opinion on things. So uh, vitamin C of course we know is an antioxidant meaning that it, it uh, can correct molecules with unstable electrons which are called free radicals. That's what free radicals are. And when they get into those molecules and into the cells they misshape the cells 
and then they cause the cells to dysregulate. And that's why they're so important for us nutritionally because dysregulating cells can lead to cancer, right? So we wanna keep those cells as healthy as we possibly can. So uh, antioxidants are really important for us. Um, vitamin C helps in tissue healing, in wound healing, and that's a collagen formation that it promotes. It fights infections. It helps your cell's energy factory, the mitochondria in the cell, and it fights colds through deactivating histamines. Best to get it from your daily food intake. That is the best way to get it because of the bioavailability and the absorption. So orange juice, or better yet, a fresh orange, peel it and eat it because you're also going to get good fiber when you do that and cut down the sugar that you're gonna intake from juice. Um, sliced bell peppers, strawberries, a baked potato, plain please, no butter or sour cream on it. Um, how much do we need every day? 75 milligrams a day for women, 90 for men. Smokers, you need more because uh, the smoking inhibits, the so nicotine inhibits it. So you need to add another extra 35 milligrams a day. So an example day could be three quarters of a cup of orange juice. See, there's 93 right there. One half of a red bell pepper and a baked potato and you, you're at 205. It's so easy because so many of the foods that we like and eat pretty regularly are high in vitamin C. You can take a supplement, but it's not needed if you get enough of it through your food intake. Um, too much will upset your stomach. If your diet is good, you don't need additional supplements, as I just said. Um, challenges for older adults are that the supplementation can negatively in, uh, imp impact statin medications, which are prescribed for heart disease. So you've got to talk to your doctor about that. And sometimes older adults with income or mobility limitations don't have access to the fresh fruits and vegetables, right? They're in food deserts and they can't get a hold of them. But a glass of juice a day will meet the requirement. And generally, we can all get a hold of orange juice. Uh, let me see. I want to take away... I have a picture here of everybody and I wanna move it so that I can show you some other, let's see if that'll do it. Can I move that? Yeah, some other top vitamin C foods over here on the right-hand side. Red peppers, we just talked about those. Guava, um, oranges, kale, um, kiwi fruit, green peppers, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, grapefruit and strawberries, all really good sources of vitamin C. Let's talk about vitamin D really quickly as well. Vitamin D, very important. We're all deficient when we live in a northern climate. Uh, we're, if, we're, if we're within the safe range, we're going to be at the low end of the range. And most of us are below the range. I typically am every year, even though I uh, do as much as I can um, with vitamin D, and I also supplement vitamin D. It is a fat-soluble vitamin. What does that mean? That means you need to take it with fat. You shouldn't just throw it down the throat and swallow it. So I buy a vitamin D supplement that is packed in coconut oil, and I buy it on Amazon. So it's already packed in fat, right? Otherwise, take it with food uh, when you take your vitamin D, because when it goes down with food, it's going to get that fat solubility um, synthesis going. The food is going to dissolve the vitamin D and make it soluble and absorbable for your body. If you've been taking it and just taking it with water, change it up and take it with some food or buy a different vitamin D. Uh, look for the one that I buy on Amazon. I don't know the brand off the top of my head, but if you just search on it, you know, vitamin D in coconut oil, I'm sure a couple of different options will come up. It promotes calcium absorption. I think this is pretty well known, you know, from a nutritional perspective. It protects against cognitive decline, memory and brain processing. That's why it's important that we have enough and that we're not uh, deficient in it. It can slow the progression of Parkinson's. It helps muscle cells grow uh, in children and it preserves muscle, muscle tissue in we adults, which we know starts to diminish as we age, even if we're exercising. So it can be a protector against many diseases such as type two diabetes, tuberculosis, inflammation, multiple sclerosis, macular degeneration, hypertension, and even some cancers. You see my capital letters there, really important to older adults that we're getting enough vitamin D. Best way to get it is from sunshine. We don't always have that option, right? Two to three times a week outside in the sun for 10 to 20 minutes. You've gotta of course be careful with your UV exposure, but that is enough. If you could do that, if you could just sit outside two to three times a week in the good weather and absorb the sun for 10 minutes, you're not going to 
you know, I'm, hopefully you're not going to burn in 10 minutes. I'm pretty fair. And I know that I won't burn in 10 minutes. I might get red, but when I come back in the house out of the sun, it goes away. So, uh, but again, you've got to, you've got to use caution. And if you do wear sunscreen, remember, you're going to filter out some of that good benefit. You have to wear sunscreen if you're going to be out in the sun all day. So look at how you can find that balance between a limited dose of sunshine and needing to put your sunscreen on. I usually will go out and garden and after 20 minutes, I'll start putting on sunscreen. So I'm in and out of the sun. I'm in the shade and in the sun a little bit if I'm gardening in my yard. So I'll do my first 20 minutes or so and then I'll put on sunscreen. That's me. That's my choice for myself. You make the smart choice for you and listen to your dermatologist, of course. Um, supplement when you can't get enough of it. We all need to be supplementing in the winter and we need um, 600 a day. Um, so example, two cups of fortified milk, salmon, egg yolk. You can see the numbers there. Cod liver oil, a phenomenal way to get vitamin D in. Grandma was right. Take your cod liver oil. Um, Ask your doctor, you know, about supplementation. If you're not supplementing today, most doctors do uh, recommend supplementation. So our, as we age, our ability to synthesize vitamin D changes and it slows down. Uh, we don't actively activate it as we age. So we're, we're sort of double impaired uh, because we're in a northern climate and we're aging and now we're you know, we're really uh, in a deficiency when it comes to our vitamin D. We also, many of us under consume it nutritionally. So um, women in a national health and nutrition examination survey, women aged 51 to 70, we're only getting 156 IUs a day of it from their food. And we need 600. So you can see we're just deficient naturally um, based on our diets. So um, some great top vitamin D foods, sunlight, of course, cod liver oil, salmon, there's another benefit from salmon, mackerel, tuna, sardines, raw milk, eggs, caviar, and mushrooms. So again, all, um, uh, all good natural food sources of that. So I'll jump back now to our other deck, but I did want to, you know, go to those really quickly because I had done that extra research on those antioxidants. So Let's go on here. It seems that the screen freezes a little bit here when I do that back and forth. Let's see if we can get it moving forward. There we go. So healthy choice. Let me see there. I didn't want to skip spices. I wanted to spend a, a minute on spices. So we've talked about uh, turmeric, right, or curcumin or curry right? All of those, one and the same, right? Um, curry and curcumin, uh, or curry and turmeric are your sources for curcumin. That's the way to say that. So other great spices are saffron, sage, cinnamon, basil, thyme, oregano, garlic, ginger, and rosemary, and they all have different nutritional properties they contribute to. Uh, we talked about the turmeric, um, which is thickening that blood-brain barrier. It's also thought to decrease plaque in the brain, um, saffron is an antidepressant, sage helps boost memory, cinnamon helps us regulate blood sugar, uh, which is great, and also blood pressure. Basil improves blood flow to the heart and brain and is anti-inflammatory. Uh, thyme increases the amount of DHA, that essential fatty acid in the brain that we mentioned. Uh, oregano has brain healing antioxidant power. Garlic promotes better blood flow to the brain. Uh, but we have to be careful because garlic supplements can also thin the blood. So that's a talk to your doctor about that. Uh, ginger may be, hope, may be helpful in the treatment of Parkinson's and migraines. And rosemary diminishes cognitive decline in people with dementia. Uh, so we should be feeding uh, any loved one with dementia rosemary baked chicken regularly and try to help them with more rosemary in their diet as well. Now, again, not cures, more more in the preventative column, but can also be helpful uh, along the way in terms of modulating symptoms back to a more manageable place. So think about how you can incorporate some of these things within your diet. I often stir cinnamon into plain yogurt because the taste of plain yogurt is just okay. You know, it's not offensive to me, but it doesn't jazz up uh, much either. So I'll stir cinnamon in it sometimes um, sprinkle nuts in it so that I can get some of my nuts in for the day that way as well. 
dark chocolate, of course, is our best choice. We've talked about that, and, and it's, it's got something called a flavanol um, attribute. So it's flavanol rich. Um, I said 70, this says 60, this guidance says 60 or higher with less sugar. Um, 60 will be a little less bitter than 70, that's, per, that's for sure. Um, and Hershey's extra dark, dark chocolate improved blood flow two hours after eating in 45 participants in a study. Some of the best brands uh, that you'll find regularly in your supermarket are Pasha, Lindt, Green and Black's, Ghirardelli, and Godiva. I also happen to like um, the little Dove square dark chocolates that, you know, that are wrapped in the individual foils. Um, I like those as well. They're probably at the lower end here, though. I should check and see if they're really uh, at a high enough cacao count. Um, if you add Hershey's unsweetened cocoa to foods and coffee, uh, it will, it's heart healthy to do so. Um, I don't love it. I've tried to do that. I've stirred it into coffee and I actually found I really just prefer my coffee plain <laughs> and don't like what it does in it. So, um, you know, maybe there's a, there are other ways to, uh, to take it in. Maybe you can add a, a low sugar or create a low sugar hot chocolate. Um, instead of, you know, one that's high in sugar. Um, consider using some of the more natural sweeteners instead of just white sugar to make something like that. Uh, we're not going to play name that food bingo because we don't have time. And um, take your doctor or be sure and tell your doctor what you take. And that's why they do ask uh, not only about um, prescription medications, but also about your supplements, because sometimes there are interactions between supplements. Do you all remember some, I want to say 15, maybe even 20 years ago when St. John's wort had a huge adoption as a natural mood elevator antidepressant, but then it turned out that it had a really bad negative interaction with some um, life-sustaining medications. And so that's why you, you do want to talk to your doctor about your supplements and your medications. Multivitamins are, are certainly recommended. Uh, remember, we talked about that bioavailability. We may not be getting everything we need from our natural food sources. So consider supplementation. I am not right now taking a multivitamin. My supplementation uh, consists of my vitamin D. Um, I'm taking zinc and I've been taking it throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, and I'm taking um, uh, red yeast rice as a natural supplement to help bring my cholesterol down. Uh, probably should be adding a multivitamin in. I just haven't done it for a while. I kind of go on and off taking the multivitamins. Uh, vitamin E for eye health, vitamin C for immunity, B12 is a stress vitamin as well. So when we do our stress module, we'll talk a little bit more about it next month. Uh, red blood cells, um, uh, good for the production of them as well. And what did I say needed to work with B12 earlier? I think it was... Folic acid, right? Folic acid folate, which is a B vitamin, relies on B12 to synthesize. Um, so again, that, that's a good reason to consider supplementation there. Uh, those two are right there on the list together. And then choline we talked about, and we've talked about how important water is and how you can get an added benefit if you drink some mineral water and add it into your diet. We've talked about the omega-3s. Uh, and omega-6s. You can see the difference here in the food types, and we need a good balance between them um, nutritionally. We, we need to not be super heavy in our omega-6s against our omega-3s. Um, I don't know too many of us who will be eating kangaroo meat here as a strong uh, contributor of omega-6s, but apparently it's a superfood. Who knew? <laughs> so um, I prefer raw walnuts. I really like those a lot, and I uh, like raw almonds as well. Those are probably my two favorite um, nuts to eat that aren't roasted and salted, because then we're adding bad things to them when we're doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And here are some, yeah, go ahead. Was there a question? Oh, that was me. I am just, um, we're going to have to wrap up. Is this your last yep. slide? Okay, I have another program starting at 2.30, so, all yeah, right. Yeah, but this, this has been amazing. Last... I want you to keep talking. <laughs> this is my last slide today. I'm always happy 
to research some more uh, nutrition and do another module on it, you know, we can dive deeper into some of the vitamins or minerals or, you know, just other uh, nutrient dense foods. Um, we can certainly, that'd be great homework for me for a future course. But um, I, I recommend choosemyplate.gov. That's a good site for nutritional guidance. I used it when I did a, a lot of my master's research. And then really quickly, we didn't get to it, but it's in my Alzheimer's module. There's another um, diet out there called the MIND diet. And the MIND diet is a combination of the Mediterranean and the DASH put together munged together. That's the mind diet. So uh, we can talk about that in a future module, but you guys have been great. I love this topic so much. It's so important for us to be getting nutrition that's good for our brain. Uh, we should all care about it so much for ourselves and our loved ones. And it's been, it's always my honor to spend time with you. It's been great to be with you today. And um, I'm sorry that I I talked so much and we didn't know we love that I could I could really tell how passionate you are and it's contagious so thank you very much and yeah um, I hope you'll I think you'll we'll all shop, agree shop that, differently now shop differently yeah. yes and I think your passion really is what's driving it home to our heart so thank you and we will take you up on on a future uh program that dives deeper so start doing your homework my friend okay all right <laughs> i want to thank challenge. cap again for um sponsoring this amazing brain um brainstorm program and i look forward to next month next month it's it's a great topic so um it's called sensational brain Okay, is that right? Yeah, I thought we were, I thought we were doing stress next month, but um, but all right, you not. and I will talk off off site. We'll talk offline. Either okay. way, they're, they're all right. I thoughtful. have to start. I'm tired. Everybody, okay. all right. Thank Happy you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye.